Hello, Richard. Um, thank you for taking the time to talk with me about your piece. So tell us about this piece. How did it come about? Well, uh, when, uh, you know, I, I had written uh, my first piano trio um, quite a long time ago, 1997, so about 25 years ago. And uh, it's a piece that is among my favorites of my pieces. So for a long time, I had wanted to write a second trio. Mm -hmm. And uh, when um, I was asked to compose a piece for Collage's 50th season, I thought that would be a great opportunity to write a second trio. Um, so that's that's really how it came about. Great. I, I haven't seen the title of your piece. Uh, the title of the piece is, it's a French title, it's Il était une fois, mm. which is the way that all French fairy tales begin. Mm -hmm. It's the it's the French equivalent of, of the American Once Upon a Time. Right. So is it of a narrative quality? or? Yes, I would say so. I would say all my music is narrative. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, so I'm also wondering if there are any unique things that you want the audience to listen for in this piece, for example, an ostinato or particular motive or rhythmic pattern or anything. Right. Um, well, so I had been, um, thinking about, uh, classical and romantic music, actually. In fact, I'd been listening a lot to uh, the first piano trio of Felix Mendelssohn, mm -hmm. uh, which is um, a, a marvelous and amazing piece of music. And I was just so taken with its its power. Um, uh, it's, it's just an extraordinary piece. And, um, and, not, and that's not to say that I wanted to try to imitate it in any way, uh, but um, but I did feel I did feel inspired by that piece in the sense uh, that it gave me so much um, uh, so much um, appreciation of the possibilities of the genre, you know, of the, of the medium of a piano trio. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in thinking about um, music of the classical and romantic period, obviously that piece is from that those times. Um, I was thinking about the approach to the differences between the the tonal period, the classical and romantic periods, and our own time, the 20th and 21st centuries, in terms of how composers approach the de development in a piece. Mm -hmm. uh, because we're very used to, you know, for the last 120 years, we're very used to a kind of music where development is going on all the time and happens at a very rapid pace, um, whereas in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, composers reserved a particular part of a piece for development of materials. So themes in the beginning of a movement would be uh, stated in an expository manner and then and then subjected to a kind of fragmentation and, and developmental exploration in the middle of the piece uh, before, the, before the themes then would return um, in a uh, in a form very close to their original form, and so I I, I, th I felt this was a uh, would be an interesting challenge to see if it were if it was possible to approach development in this way in a in a modernist aesthetic, mm -hmm. uh, and so that was my plan for the first movement. So the first movement of the piece is really modeled after classical sonata form movements with a couple of um, important exceptions. One exception is that it's not tonal music. Right. And of course the sonata form in classical and romantic periods is very much a tonal form that, that uh, depends on and makes use of tonal relationships. Um, so it's different in that sense. And uh, the other, difference is um, that I think it would be good for listeners to be aware of is that the second what what we would call the second theme of the movement which is a very lyrical theme in the cello mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. uh, with piano accompaniment. The violin is quiet at that time. Um, does not come back at the end of the movement. Mm. In fact, I felt I felt that, and when I thought, well, should I bring this back? You know, I debated with myself: should I bring this theme back? And it just seemed like too obvious a thing to do to bring it back. And so, so instead, the music jumps immediately to a, a closing theme. Um, and then, uh, but then I felt, well, I, I I can't just abandon that cello music. Uh, it has to come back somewhere. So, in fact, it becomes the main idea of the second movement. Mm, I see. Although it's introduced uh, by the violin instead of the cello, and not it's not exactly the same music, but it has the same the same character, the same kinds of qualities to it. Um, and uh, and and actually, I, I ended up being uh, rather pleased with the. Um, with how I approached the this development section, you know what we call a develop, development section with the fragmentation of thematic materials, and that that I felt uh, worked very well. So um, so I you know I think it's important would be important for listeners to to have that perspective on the piece. Um, the second movement is uh, is framed by this this lyrical music that that's you know taken from the, the cello's theme in the first movement. Um, and then there's a, a middle section that uh, has some um, some somewhat complex counterpoint between the violin and cello. Um, that's that's really what motivates the middle part of that movement. Um, I was I was actually thinking a little bit of uh, of uh, Ravel's sonata for um, piano for violin and cello, mm -hmm. uh, although I don't think it's I don't think the music is anything like that, but uh, sure. but in, in some of the textures are somewhat similar. Sure. Uh, and then the third movement, um, the first two movements, I would say, are uh, are somewhat in the ex the expressive qualities are uh, are intense. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, in the third movement, I thought it would would be good um, to have some. To have a kind of a foil for that, you know, a, a lightening up of the of the expressive mood of the piece. So that's really what the third movement is doing. Great, um, sounds fascinating. Uh, I really look forward to hearing it. So, how long um, is the piece? I think it's probably about sixteen minutes, something like that. Wow, great. Um, I'm also wondering, so you've written a piano trio before, right? Yes. Is there any connection between these two trios or this is something completely new? I think there is not much connection between them. <laughs> and that was important to me. Uh, I didn't I didn't want to rewrite um, that that trio. And in fact, we were, we were talking about Mendelssohn earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, I, when I when I listen to his second piano trio, I always have the impression that he was that he was kind of um, imprisoned by the first one, by the success of the first trio. That he that he kept that there's. I, I always feel like he was trying to rewrite the first trio in the second trio, and um, and and I think it's a not as not as great a piece actually mm -hmm. uh, perhaps for that reason so i i really didn't i really wanted to for this piece to be very different so to be you know it's its own its own piece and not have any connection with the first trio so is that something challenging or you find it very uh, to, to make it different you mean yeah uh no in retrospect i don't think so i don't think so um it just uh it it just started out and went its own way. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I did occasionally think about the first trio and and about some of the things that I thought were per particularly successful about it. Sure. Uh, but um, but but I don't think they got in my way. 